The recording of my October 2021 presentation to University of Rochester begins at slide three, so I'm going to cover the slides up to that point and then let the recording take over. This lecture was a relatively deep dive attempt to recreate the bedside consolidation of neurophysiology instrumentation and volume conduction theory principles that go into understanding nerve conduction studies in the guise of a clinical case. My former trainee, Jamie Ott, suggested that I reorganize these topics the way I was teaching it uh, at bedside. And that's what this grand experiment is. Obviously, it lacks the practical component of holding the stimulator and performing a study on a real patient. I've tried to put all the info together in one place so you can come back here and reference it over and over again throughout your training. You can be the judge whether it's successful or not. I just left the VA and am now full-time at Altair Health in Morristown, New Jersey, still clinical professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, and I'm happy to answer any questions from residents and med students. So I thought this analogy, thought of this analogy the day before I gave the talk. Many residents are well-versed by now in the Marvel movies. These are fun, entertaining, and the world building is pretty easy to take in. Despite the enormous number of characters, most of what you need to know is given to you during the movies. As a 30-year reader of comics, for me, it's more than, than that, but you get the idea. So compare this with the Star Wars universe. If you watch episode 4, every line said by every character had a giant backstory just waiting to be discovered. When Luke says to Obi-Wan, you fought in the Clone Wars? Somehow every kid understood that there was way more to that. And indeed, seven seasons later, it was true. So why am I bringing this up? Most PM&R residents feel very comfortable with musculoskeletal training, but very intimidated by the neuromuscular and electrodiagnostic concepts. They shy away from it for that reason. My feeling is that musculoskeletal medicine is still in its infancy of scientific evidence, while neurophysiology has some very good hard science backing it up. So I acknowledge that it's harder, but just like Star Wars, it's so satisfying. Um, so what I realized as a resident is that we uh, typically um, look at the patient as if they're a black box. And then we typically look at the equipment like it's a black box, right? We do something to it and then something happens and you probably have enough to write your report and move on to the next patient. And that works to a certain point. But I think as physicians, we really do need to know what's in the black boxes. And this is where that Star Wars things comes in. I'm going to teach you stuff and you're going to think you understand it or maybe you get lost. But over time, the layers start to uh, add up. And I specifically for you guys reinvented this talk instead of saying, OK, here's neurophysiology, here's uh, volume conduction theory, here's um, instrumentation. I've put this in kind of a sequence like I like happens when I'm with one of you in the EMG lab and I'm teaching it to you on the fly while we have a patient. So, so here's the outline. I'm literally going to start with what is physiatry and then I'll show you an encounter. Then we'll go through the differential. We'll work through a case. Um, I'm going to talk about stimulation uh, in ways that you probably haven't heard about it before. And then we'll just focus on sensory um, and by doing that, we'll cover the neurophys, we'll cover the instrumentation, and um, what does the SNAP mean? So let's start from the beginning. So um, what is uh, physiatry? It's, uh, well, we're people who see three major areas of medical care, um, which are physical medicine, rehabilitation, and electrodiagnosis. Physical medicine is basically seeing musculoskeletal aches, pains, numbness, tingling. Some people will even add headache into that. Um, this is like your outpatient rotations. Rehab is restoring function for people who've had severe impairments. Uh, they could be neurologic, they could be things like amputations, multi-trauma, burns. And we usually are the people um, running a team approach, interdisciplinary team approach. Electrodiagnostic medicine is a subspecialty of neurology and then later PM&R. Now, neurologists really only learn this during fellowship. We have a requirement during residency. And the whole purpose is to figure out what's going on with nerves and muscles for a peripheral neuromuscular um, differential. And I have this picture of a car because, you know, I say, well, you can pop the hood of the car and that's like an MRI. 
But if you turn the key and try and figure out what's going on, that's like electrodiagnosis. And usually there's two parts, EMG and nerve conduction studies. There's going to be a lot of repetition. And each time I repeat, I'm going a little deeper. So just allow for that. So residency requirements are that you do 200 uh, electrodiagnostic encounters. Yeah, I think it's been uh, more lenient about it. And, and now you can do 50% observed. That means you're in the room, but someone else is performing it, but you're kind of cognitively actively involved. And um, I kind of helped with the milestones that the ACGME took on. I, I didn't realize I was doing that. Dr. Garstang was the one writing them and she was across the hall from me and she said, hey, what would you do for electrodiagnosis? So I apologize if you don't like those milestones, that's my fault. Um, the American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine requires that you do another 200 after graduating and uh, then you take their board exam and then you're board certified in electrodiagnostic medicine. Um, so what is electrodiagnosis? Basically your cells are constantly uh, discharging electrically. And that can be recorded, displayed, measured, and interpreted by the use of equipment. When disease alters the architecture and physiology of nerves and muscles, then you can see observable changes in the discharges. And these can be useful for establishing a diagnosis, monitoring disease progression, and assessing therapeutic interventions. So basically using equipment to look at um, aspects of the nerves and muscles. The benefits of testing are confirming clinical suspicion, it addresses the neuromuscular differential, and it guides other diagnostic testing or imaging. But it can bring more value than just diagnostic. Many clinicians aren't aware that numerous studies have shown excellent recovery and return to work with non-surgical treatment when abnormalities are present on electrodiagnostic testing paired with imaging. They're also associated with statistically significant and meaningful, clinically meaningful uh, improvements in disability, prognosis, and response to treatments when compared to those who have normal tests. Some more generalities. The testing is generally preceded by a short history and physical exam in order to generate a working peripheral neuromuscular differential. Um, and I wrote in there, the codes actually um, include that you're supposed to do 10 minutes of um, history and physical. So because there are shocks and needles involved, there are some people who may opt out of the test. So some more uh, generalities. Basically, you're a clinician. You're not a technician. Yeah, this is more of a technical component to our encounter, but you're a clinician. So what does that mean? You do a history, you do an exam, and then it's broken into a clinical exam and then also the electrodiagnostic part. So I uh, stole this idea for the slide from someone I met at AANEM. Electrodiagnostic testing is an extension of the history and physical exam said by every great electromyographer. Uh, Dr. Narula uh, had that slide and I, I asked for permission. Yeah, you're gonna hear everyone say it. Listen now, this is an extension of your physical exam. It's not you know, on its own. So we're gonna go through a play-by-play -play, and this stars uh, Dr. Im, who's really Dr. Salim's mentor, not me. And then my co-chief residents uh, at the time I made these slides. So allow yourself to smile at these. Um, first of all, you're going to get some kind of referral, and it could be really anything. Um, you'd be surprised at the things that I've been told to rule out and the things that brought them into the lab. Uh, so introduce yourself. Make sure they know that you're a doctor, that you went to medical school. I really literally have to do this uh, to them. I tell them, yes, I, I did residency, and um, you know I'm wearing more of a technical hat today. Um, then you're going to start with a history, and this is to establish, whoops, establish the differential. Um, you're trying to figure out maybe is it neurological really, or could this be some other body system that's involved? Um, and then if it is neurologic, hey, is it bilateral? Is it diffuse? Is it uh, regional? Is it more proximal than distal? These things will clue you into the, um, uh, the differential. Then your physical exam is basically used to confirm your thoughts from the history. And this will help direct what type of tests you choose to do because those are not set in stone. This is supposed to be a Sperlings and he's supposed to be showing that he's in pain, but uh, I don't know, his acting skills were a little off. So I just wanted to review in case you haven't done an outpatient rotation. You know, inspection is always documented first and you're looking at gait, station. You're looking at their muscle bulk here. I'm showing you atrophy and a little bit of contracture. Uh, they may have, um, you know, Trendelenburgs, either uncompensated or compensated. Um, and then your neuro exam, really you should be 
pretty familiar with even on your inpatient rotations. And if you're not, please go over it with your attendings. So after you've done a physical exam, that's when the nerve conductions occur. You're basically placing electrodes over muscles or nerves, and then you're stimulating a nerve by delivering electricity. And then the signal goes through a black box, you see waveforms on a screen, and then you extrapolate properties of it. Uh, usually as demonstrated here, the attending is sleeping in the corner and doesn't really care how you do these, uh, just get it done. You don't use text, do you, Sarah? I'm um, not in our department. Good, good, okay. It's good to learn these, they're important. It, there is um, devil in the details. Then you get to the electromyography where you're sticking a needle in the patient and um, you're irritating the muscle and you're kind of listening like it's a microphone and you see waveforms on the screen and then you analyze it. And no matter how good your technique, your attending always has something to correct about the way you're doing it. Just uh, accept that. After you've poked them inside and out, you're, you probably owe them an explanation and it's not always good news. Okay, dad humor. All right, so why bother with electrodiagnostic testing? It's the differential. That's the one thing, I'm bad cop in these programs. I, with the teaching, I point out when people don't know stuff and then I spoon feed them. Um, so it kind of balances out. But the differential is so, so important. So I point out this patient with chest pain. Why? Because all of you have done an intern year. And um, if someone said chest pain, you're basically like the Terminator, right? You have this like screen in front of your eyes with the differential. You know, these are the top things I have to rule out. These are the things it's most likely is, but aren't that dangerous. And then these are the things I say on rounds, right? Like you have that ability with chest pain. You probably have that with shortness of breath too because of your intern year. But you need to do that with everything in rehab now. If someone says shoulder pain, it should be like, bam, same way. Numbness, tingling, balance issues, weakness, right? So if you're not thinking like that right now, you're behind, you're behind the curve. You're probably gonna figure it out after you become an attending and it'll be, Maybe too late, maybe not. So start thinking like that. If a patient comes in with shoulder pain without looking at them, without knowing their history, just think generally, okay, I got my neurologic things it could be. I got my musculoskeletal things it could be. I got my scary medical things it could be. And okay, sir, then your history is basically trying to capture all of that. And then your physical exam is screening and confirming. And this is the best information I can give you um, in this talk, if you're not already doing that. So, right, should be evident um, with the chief complaint. And then I say here, the eyes, the eye sees only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. So if you don't know a certain diagnosis exists, so I did pretty well on my PMNR boards and I was, you know, at a good program and two years into doing musculoskeletal, a DO told me about sacral torsion and I'd never heard of that. I didn't, it's, I, I had to go look through special books for it. How could I find that if I don't even know it exists, right? It's the same thing with electrodiagnosis. Like lots of people are like, oh, motor neuron diseases, those are so rare, that's esoteric. I'll look at it later. But when the patient presents to you, you're not gonna know to even think about that if you haven't thought about it. So I'm definitely on my high horse. Just raise your hand, the people who have their cameras open. Is this helpful or am I getting too? Yeah, good, all right, thank you. Um, all right, so I love this picture because it's got both the sensory pathway and the motor pathway simplified. Here's the brain, the spinal cord is here, and then the periphery is here, right? So in teal, you have uh, the sensory, so we should start here. There's some kind of sensory organ here, and then there's a nerve sending the signal along the limb and then it, there's a cell body in the dorsal root ganglion here. And then it goes up the dorsal columns. And then there's some synapses, there's a thalamus, and then there's some place in the brain where you finally feel it. For efferent, um, you have an upper motor neuron in the brain. Um, there's some crossover. And then it synapses with a lower motor neuron. The lower motor neuron goes through the ventral root, um, through the plexus, the, uh, a nerve, and then eventually, uh, a neuromuscular junction and um, muscle fibers. And I'm gonna probably say this three more times this talk. So that pathway is basically what I teach my residents to think about 
as a systematic approach to the differential diagnosis when something neuromuscular comes in. So yeah, could be something in the skull, it could be something in the spine. Motor neuron diseases, well, the motor neurons sit in the spinal cord, so it's kind of right there. Radiculopathies um, come outward a little bit, then you get to the plexuses, and then the peripheral nerves can either affect all the nerves or one nerve. Um, then you can have neuromuscular junction conditions, which is, a, and then the, finally, the most distal component is myopathies. So if you just keep this in your head when someone comes in with weakness, you know, you're probably not going to miss, uh, you're not going to not have thought of something because you were lazy about it cognitively. So this is a picture from Bradham and I superimposed some stuff for, on it. But basically you have spinal cord here, the anterior horn, which has anterior horn cells that have the efferent um, and uh, alpha motor neurons projecting their axons through the ventral root. The ventral root joins the dorsal root ganglion to form the spinal nerve. Then you have a dorsal ramus, you have a ventral primary ramus, and then the ventral primary ramus takes everything to the plexuses and peripheral nerves, etc. The important thing is that the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion. So the root is, dorsal root is considered to be preganglionic. So electrodiagnostic testing uh, is used generally for peripheral um, neuro Sorry, Dr. Malhotra, if you can go yeah. back to that one slide again. Uh, so in this image, if you can point out what what we typically call like the nerve root, as if that's, uh, yeah, I actually learned from you that that's kind of a misnomer, but what's the nerve root when we're talking about the nerve root? Oh, I did? I yeah. said it was a... <laughs> Well, oh, oh, you mean in, when we're talking about plexuses? Yeah. Yeah. So like, oh, that's true. You know how they say like Randy Travis drinks cold beer, the roots tr trunks. The, actually, for them, it doesn't matter. Roots and rami don't matter. But for us electrodiagnostic uh, physicians, there's a huge difference between if there's a lesion here, which is the root, and if there's a lesion here, which is the ramus. So the ramus has a mixed uh, sensory motor. You know, it's blue and red here whereas the root is either um, red or blue and it's post uh, preganglionic if it's the blue. So that looks different on your electrodiagnostic testing. If we do get to radiculopathy, I have it covered in that, but that's good. Thank you for bringing that up. So who do we give, uh, who do we perform tests on? Really, it shouldn't be for anyone with central nervous system considerations. If you're trying to rule out peripheral in the context of central, that's fine. The other thing is it's not a pain test. Radiating pain is a better reason to get electrodiagnostic testing, but its pain should not be the reason someone gets electrodiagnostic testing, academically speaking. Am I doing testing in people with pain? Of course I am, but I'm here as your academic um, instructor. So that's the first part. I hope that felt easy. Whoops. I hope that felt easy. We just talked about um, basically, you know, Star Wars versus <laughs> Marvel, um, a little bit of anatomy. Uh, a play-by-play -play of an electrodiagnostic encounter, which includes a history of physical. The history and physical should be dictated by the differential. So should the electrodiagnostic testing, which is an extension of the physical exam. And we did a little bit of anatomy there. Okay, so I'm gonna pretend we're talking about a case in order to teach, teach you this stuff. So here's a, a young woman with one month of painless numbness and tingling in the first three digits of the left hand. So, if you're thinking like I told you to think, you should immediately be like, oh, could this be brain? Could this be cord? Could this be a radic, plexopathy, motor neuron disease, motor neuropathy, neuromuscular junction disorder, myopathy, just like when you were an intern with chest pain. You should immediately just start there. You and I know what it is, but you start there. So what do you want? On history, we call it clodiers, character, location, onset, duration, intensity, exacerbating factors, relieving factors, social um, effect. So her clodiers is basically no different from what I put there. One month of painless numbness and tingling. It doesn't, it just, you know, wakes her up. Um, anything else you guys want to know? Probably occupation is the most important. So she's a clerk. Yep. But anything else on HPI? You said it just started progressively and just kind of like all of a sudden. Yep. Now I want, I'm, I'm asking you to read my mind. I just put this list here for you. Is there anything else you should be asking? 
any like decrease in function, like unable to button or take tops off, anything like that. We yep, she's having trouble with fine motor. Yep. But what else? Is it just speculation? Uh sorry, Josh, what did you say? Is it just symptoms in the left hand? Good. So you're asking, is there stuff in other hand or anywhere else? Yeah, including I'm other extremities. Your mind here. Yeah, it's feet, sorry. feet, <laughs> great, uh, or feet or face, right? Because yeah. if it's face, oh my God, could this be brain pathology? If it's feet, that could be cord pathology. It could be uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, could be, um, yeah, unusual to have four plexuses affected, but you know, that would change your differential, right? We're all thinking carpal tunnel, right? But if you don't do what I just told you, you will fail your oral boards. And honestly, you'd fail my rotation because you're gonna miss everything that's not obvious. Do you see what I'm, where I'm get going with this now? Okay, good. So yeah, so what uh, Dr. Salim said, very important. She's a clerk for an MD. She's doing stuff with her hands all day, but um, she has a nice ergonomic desk. She lives alone in an apartment. She denies any alcohol or tobacco and her review of systems is negative. She doesn't have any like speech or swallowing deficits. She doesn't have any bowel bladder changes. All those things are important for that differential. It's not, you know, it's not academic. It's because you want to not be missing anything. So on exam, what would you look for briefly? Think about the uh, differential again. Strength. Any atrophy, skin changes? Yeah, atrophy and skin changes would be good because you're thinking about things like myopathies, neuromuscular issues, and um, uh, skin changes. Yeah. And uh, what else could help you with brain pathology? Any like gait imbalance when they're walking in or? Gait would help with three things, uh, brain pathology, cord pathology, actually it could be motor neuron disease and it could also be uh, peripheral neuropathy, myopathy. Yeah, so gait would be very good to look at. Um, and right away, while you're talking to her, you probably, have assessed her cranial nerves, yeah. right? So that'll help too. I'm not saying to document a cranial nerve exam in a carpal tunnel workup. I'm just saying, just be thinking like, hey, you know, I've, I've seen ocular issues. I've seen um, undiagnosed. I've seen, um, you know, flattening. I've seen speech issues in people who came for carpal tunnel. And I'm like, hey, did you ever notice this? Yeah. Has your doctor said anything? No. Your doctor is a brain surgeon. Yeah. Okay, well, let me go back. And it turned out to be, you know, a tumor. So I'm, I'm not saying this because it's just academic. You can be their hero. Okay, so on exam, normal cranial nerves, she had normal reflexes. I'm just moving through it fast. I would have made it more painful. Normal reflexes, manual muscle testing, range of motion uh, and inspection. But she has a positive carpal compression test, negative spurlings, uh, negative phalans, negative reverse phalans and negative tunnels. So. You know, a lot of this helped us with that differential. It's the screening part, right? We talked about screening so that we don't get anchored. So if you find jumpy reflexes in the lowers and a Babinski and, you know, a Hoffman's is asymmetric and things like that, that's when you go further into that testing to make sure you're not missing anything. It's sort of like if they went to a cardiologist for an echo and they completely missed the AFib. You'd be like, dude, that's your world, right? This is your world. You are the neuromuscular and musculoskeletal doctor. Okay, so this was the one we were talking about, the initial differential. So now let's look at our new one, which I think we would all agree, highest on our list is carpal tunnel, right? Median mononeuropathy at the wrist. Next would be radic. Next would be something in the plexus on that side. And maybe it's the start of a polyneuropathy. But to be honest, I'm really not thinking of anything intracranial, intraspinal. It's, there's no weakness. So it'd be weird to call this a motor neuron disease, a neuromuscular junction disorder, or a myopathy. So far, so good. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, good. All right, going back. What further testing do you want? What are our options? I came on late, but did you do any like EMG or nerve conduction studies? Yes. Uh, electrodiagnostic testing is an excellent idea. And you just mentioned two things, uh, EMG and nerve conduction. Okay. So you're off the hooks. Ultrasound. Ultrasound. So imaging. 
if you really want to get fancy, like MRI or some other. Yes, <laughs> more imaging. Yes, more imaging. So the two of you have mentioned imaging. But I can't really think of another. What if, what if you've what if suspected a brain tumor? Yeah, um, I mean, I think like a CT of the head or something like that as well. Right. I mean, Let's say you found that. Let's say we found the the brain tumor. Yeah. Well, I think uh, is this patient referred to us, or do we need to refer them back to? That's you know, my point. Nurse. Consultation. You got it. That's exactly right. And then imaging we talked about. Um, there's one more that has been missed. Anyone else can think of any other tests you might think? What if they had a peripheral neuropathy, or you were suspecting a neuromuscular junction disorder? Bubs. Yeah, labs, blood, urine, biopsy, and then electrodiagnostic testing. Okay, great. So now these are our options, and now you should be able to, you know, spit these out next time I ask. So what further testing do you want in this case? Um, I'm going to just speak for all of us at this point and say, I think nerve conductions are my favorite out of these at this moment, because I think she has carpal tunnel. And specifically, we can talk later. Another thing that might be good because of Redick, EMG. That may also help with plexopathy, motor neuron disease, and some of the other diagnoses. If I see a redic, I'm going to move to our MRI, or if I see a plexopathy, a plexus MRI. And depending on what I find, I may need to send to neurology or neurosurgery. Everyone good? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, good. All right. This is pretty basic, but I think the basics are important. <laughs> so if I am going to do nerve conductions, which ones do I want to do? I'm telling you, sensories here are my, my favorite because that'll tell me what's going on. Motors, maybe some late responses. And if it's a neuromuscular junction condition, maybe rep stim, but in order of preference is what I just gave you. And if I'm doing electromyography, these are the things I'm going to look for. So the plan for this patient is I'm going to do a median sensory. Depending on what I see there, I'll do a median motor. Then I'll do an ulnar sensory to show that the rest of the body is fine or the rest of the plexus is fine ulnar motor that also supports that. And then I'll do EMG in muscles representing the cervical roots and plexus components that I believe are involved. Does that make sense? Even if you've never done EMG, just the thinking should make sense. And if not, maybe the rest of the lecture will help. All right, so nerve conduction studies. What are nerve conduction studies? Well, shocks are delivered to the body for nerve conduction testing. After the nerve is stimulated with this exogenous current, pick up electrodes elsewhere on the body, display the electrical activity generated by nerves or muscles. The picture on the screen is called the evoked response. The x-axis measures time and the y-axis measures voltage. So we will now go a little deeper into nerve conduction studies. Let's do what, what are sensory nerve conduction studies. Basically, a nerve is stimulated by an externally delivered electrical impulse. Electrodes pick up the electrical activity, aka the evoked response, which is generated thereafter by sensory neurons within the entire nerve. That evoked response is called a SNAP, or sensory nerve action potential. The SNAP is the electrical signal summation of discharges by the sensory neurons' depolarizing membranes, or their axolemmas. Look. This slide is so packed with backstory. This is like when Obi-Wan met Luke for the first time and then they just made movies out of it, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take each component of this and I'm going to unpack it for you. So we use the word nerve. What the heck is a nerve? Well, as you know, neurons are cells serving as the structural and functional units of the nervous system, sending messages from one part of the body to another. Structurally speaking, the majority that physiatrists deal with um, are the multipolar, which have variably branched processes projecting in many directions for diversified input that's integrated at the cell body. The bipolars are seen in sensory organs like the eye and nose, and unipolars are limited to invertebrae. But please take note of the pseudo unipolar neurons. They have two processes which fuse during their development into one short common axon, which splits into one branch that terminates in the periphery, while the second branch heads to the spinal cord. And I showed you that in my picture. This way, stimuli from the periphery bypass the cell body and reach the axon terminal without delay. So 
I just told you pretty much all this and you learned all this in, in your uh, med school. But one thing that I've seen offers some confusion is there are actually two classification systems. You know, one uses Roman numerals and one uses letters. Just keep in mind that there's two different ones. One talks about afferent and efferent, and the other one is only for afferent. So just, I'm not asking you to memorize this, but people use A alpha or type two or something. You probably will confuse these if you don't know it. So if we look at the nervous system as being the central and peripheral nervous systems, then everything that's not spinal cord or brain is peripheral. So a bundle of nerve fibers conveying Im impulses between different parts of the body are called either roots, nerves, or rami, depending on where they are. If you slice a nerve, you'll see that it has a skin or epineurium. Inside are bundles or fascicles surrounded by connective tissue called perineurium. The bundled axons are themselves surrounded by a matrix called endoneurium. This is super important for us electromyographers because it has to do with prognosis. So to summarize, neurons are structural functional units. Neurons can be classified by their location, function, and size. Each axon is surrounded by endoneurium. They're bundled together, surrounded by perineurium. The perineuriums, the, the fascicles are a bundle, which is called a nerve, and that's surrounded by epineurium. The sensory neuron cell body lies in the dorsal root ganglion and a lower motor neuron's cell body lies in the spinal cord, usually the anterior horn. This has to be burned in your brain too. You can't get through physiatry without knowing that. So we've defined nerve. It's stimulated by an externally delivered electrical impulse. Again, so much to uh, unpack in there. So let me show you. This is what the setup ultimately looks like. But what you don't see is that I abrasively first swabbed the hand to improve contact and decrease impedance. Then I stuck the electrodes on, if they're not self-adhering like these EKG tabs. Then we use tape. Then I put some con uh, conducting gel down, uh, just like we do with the ultrasound probe. After that, I dip my stimulator wand in the gel. I put it on the patient where the nerve is. You might be wondering why I'm saying all this. It's because some people have never even seen a nerve conduction. So this is what's happening. It would be great if I had a video. So the stimulator is a device that delivers current to the body using electrodes. And the electrodes are called cathode and anode. And the one we seem to be most interested in is cathode. Um, and these, this is what they look like. And basically it's a battery. It's got a cathode and an anode. So a little bit of physics. I used to have a whole lecture for Sarah's class on physics and I've basically combined this into two slides now. So pay attention. Current is basically any flow of charges. So if it's charged and it's flowing, that's current. What is charge? Well, it's just a fundamental phenomenon of the universe and we can't really define it today, you would have to learn about modern physics. But basically there's positives or negatives. Positives will uh, be attracted to negatives and uh, when likes will repel. The ease of flow of charges depends on the size of the electrical push on the charge, which is called voltage or electrical potential. So I'm gonna explain potential a little more. Um, and the cross-sectional area of the pathway. So think of a pipe with water, right? So you can see on the right here, there's a pipe. And if there's a pump over here pushing water through, that would be voltage. The water itself would be the ions. The water molecules would be the ions. And the cross-sectional area here, the bigger it is, the more flow you would have, so the more current you would have. So here, this, the cross-sectional area is smaller, so there's more what we call resistance or impedance. And that keeps it from getting through, right? So the, the more voltage, the more current. The more cross-sectional area, the more current. The less resistance, the more current. And that's your Ohm's law, which is V equals I over R. Sorry, V equals I R. So voltage is actually the amount of charge in one place compared with another location. So I'm gonna give you an analogy I use with my residents. These are uh, uh, transformers. This is sound wave and this is rumble. And as you can see, rumble is much smaller than sound wave. Let's say sound wave is 60 feet tall and he's 30 feet tall with his hands up, right? Well, what are we saying actually? We're actually saying sound wave is 60, 
his tip of his head is 60 feet away from the ground, right? And Rumble is 30 feet away from the ground. So what are we doing? We're comparing this and this to this. That's really important because you could say he's zero and he's 30, or you could say he's negative 30 and he's zero, right? So it's important to have a uh, place that you're comparing to. So heights or gravitational potential are compared to the distance from the ground and ground serves as the zero height. Similarly, voltages are compared to the ground as a zero charge. And the earth is considered an infinite sink and source of charges. So any voltage that you're uh, talking about, it's the amount of charge at that location compared to ground, and then the amount of charge at another location compared to ground. And then that's the comparison. And an example of a green ground electrode is seen here because that's the purpose of that green ground electrode when you're doing any kind of electrodiagnostic testing. So did this help anyone? Thumbs up if it did. Uh, don't speak if it didn't. Yeah. Eh. Josh is saying, eh, nah, maybe. Josh, did you, is it because you don't understand what I'm saying? Or did you always know what the ground electrode did? I, I think it helps helps kind of solidify things, yeah. That's the whole purpose of this, so uh, thank you. All right, so one other physics topic that comes up over and over again is capacitors. Unless you're an engineer, you probably faked your way through physics and didn't really know what this meant. So I'm gonna explain capacitors in a way you can understand. So a capacitor is two flat conductive plates, very close, but separated by a non-conductive film. So here you see a battery attached to these two plates, which are separated by air here, all right? And what you see is when you turn the battery on, the positives are going down the wire, they get to this plate and they like build up on this plate, right? And you're seeing that there's negative here. We'll talk about that in a moment. So if you have all these positives here, what happens is eventually there's a certain voltage here, there's a certain push, and it can only push as many positives onto here as there is area on this plate. Otherwise the positives, they're repelling each other, right? So eventually the push back will equal the push forward and you'll reach a certain amount of charge. And that charge there we can say has been stored. There's a stored charge on that plate. So capacitors store charges. And if you ever see on your computer, when you turn off the computer, even though the power has been unplugged from the wall, you still see the light on for a little while, right? That's because there's capacitors in there which are discharging. They've stored that charge. So here we're seeing the two plates and then you see the dielectric here and the dipoles that are kind of randomly assigned, right? So what happens is when you put a charge on it, then all of a sudden the dipoles align like this, which essentially makes one giant dipole. So now all the negatives wanna be here, all the positives wanna be here. So these positives then repel the positives that are on this plate down the wire. Also there's a negative attraction because the negative part of the battery is pulling it. So now what's happened is, although no current went across the dielectric, you just created a current. This is called capacitive current, right? Because there was charges that moved positive charges went down this wire. So even though it didn't go across, there was, a, there was a current, even if it's temporary. That's called capacitive current. And it's super important because uh, when we talk about membranes and we talk about stimulation, that's what's happening. If anyone wants me to re -go, go through that again, I can, but it I would say, let's move on. It'll come back. So sensory nerve conduction studies, we just talked about a nerve and the externally delivered, oh, sorry, I, I did this wrong. Um, well, let's keep going. The externally delivered electrical impulses st and stimulation. Let's talk about the stimulation. So the plasma membrane acts as a capacitor and a resistor. So let's talk about what plasma membranes are. So I don't know if you can see this, but there's the red is hydrophilic, oops, and the green is hydrophobic. So basically what you have here is a capacitor. Two plates separated by, yeah. And then it's a barrier. So it's a resistor, nothing can get through, right? Let's go through a whole semester of cell physiology in one slide. The plasma membrane is an asymmetrical two-dimensional phospholipid fluid bilayer, which has proteins embedded in it, and they are diffusing laterally and restrict, and sometimes they're restricted to associating with other molecules, such as the cytoskeleton. You can have tight junctions keeping them in places, et cetera. And the proteins carry out specific membrane functions. And if you look at this, you also see cholesterol in between. So here you see 
the cytoskeletal skeleton of a uh, red blood cell um, keeping this protein where it is. The membrane serves as a barrier and it maintains gradients. And this ultimately defines the very identity of the cell. So, you know, there's negatively charged intracellular macromolecules inside the cell. So what do you think they're doing? They're attracting two things, positive counter ions and water. So if you had all this solute going into the cell, what would happen? The water would build up and then eventually it would burst. Yes, exactly. So what does mother nature do? She created something called the sodium potassium pump, which counters this by pumping an extra sodium for the number of potassiums that are going in. And what does that do? That creates a charge. That, that, there's a charge difference across the membrane. What is the difference in charge? Voltage. So you have a transmembrane voltage. By the way, amoeba pump the water out and plants have cell walls. So they don't need sodium potassium pumps, but we need sodium potassium pumps. So potassium in, in animals can freely move through leak channels. So they can just go along their gradient and equalize whatever needs to be equalized at that point. But that's why the resting membrane potential is negative 70 to negative 90, because that is the defined, I guess, potassium uh, equilibrium potential uh, based on concentration. So again, that was a semester of, <laughs> of physiology that I used to give her in a lecture. So reminder of a capacitor. So now, what are the different ways that we can create currents through um, uh, in, in a neuron? So the best one is if ions just go intracellularly from one side to the other. So it's like a wire, and that's the fastest way and the best way, longitudinally, intracellularly. Another way you can create current is capacitively. Um, remember I was telling you how, so with the capacitor, if I increase the number of positives here on the outside of the membrane, then the positives want to move away, right? And so flow of charges, current. So capacitive current does not require anything to be moving across the membrane. But then we also can move things through, the, through channels, and that's how you can get transmembrane current. So hopefully that uh, clarifies currents better for you than it did for me when I first learned about it. And I'm going to clarify a few other things for you. Action potentials. So we just talked about uh, why there's a resting membrane potential. It's the sodium potassium pump. But when channels open, then we get this all or nothing, self-sustaining, rapid, you know, efficient, highly efficient way of relaying information um, when stimuli are created. And this is known as the action potential, and it's based on ion permeability shifts. And it has these you know, uh, phases that you've all learned. Um, and with an unmyelinated cell, did you guys watch the YouTube video I sent? Okay, good. So if you watch the YouTube video, then you know where he lit, he lit the uh, match and the fuse went off here and then the fuse went off here and then the fuse went off here. And then fast, it looked like basically a fuse going down. That's what an unmyelinated action potential looks like. It's basically adjacent membrane depolarizing. And then the adjacent membrane behind it does not depolarize because it's going through the refractory period. If, if you're not clear on this, go back and watch the video. If you didn't watch the video, it's old school, but it's, it really makes the point. I used to have to spend lots of slides explaining that. So if you, if you use myelin though, which is basically Schwann cells wrapped around um, segmentally around uh, the axon, then what you've done is you've created a barrier to action potentials occurring. So the action potential can only occur where there are nodes, all right? And I wanna explain this. Um, at the nodes, there's tons of sodium voltage-gated sodium channels. And at the internodes, there's tons of potassium channel. So there's, even if you did strip the myelin here, an action potential wouldn't be occurring here because there's just no sodium channels. And they don't tell us that in, in med school. And the action potential is basically two nodes long. So if you lose one node, you're okay. When an action potential propagates in myelinated nerves, this is the biggest misnomer. Have you heard of saltatory 
conduction? What does that mean? Whee, I'm jumping from one node to the other, right? And it never made sense to me. What's actually happening is it's sort of like a drop of milk in a uh, glass of water. You get this like mushroom, mushrooming of all these ions, right? And ions moving as current. So you have an intra-axonal current. And when it gets to the next node, it causes a new mushroom. So it's like poof, 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 like that. <clears throat> Here's another guy showing you the same idea. So there's almost no current in between nodes and it's all at the nodes. And that's what gets you the faster nerve conduction velocity. And that's why your myelinated nerves are faster. And that's what we're testing with electrodiagnostic testing. So I propose that we stop using the word saltatory and instead we do natatory. So I liken it to, you know, when you're walking in a pool, it's real slow, but you get there, right? Versus if you go underwater, you do the breaststroke, breaststroke um, for a little while, hold your breath, and then you pop up. That's how I see the action potential being. And I think this is you know, really helpful for a lot of people who didn't understand the action potential before. So we just covered all that neurophys, but we were talking about stimulation. So how does the current from the stimulator actually evoke a response from a nerve? Well, now that you understand capacitors and the electrical aspects of the sensory neurons, just to remind you, I'm gonna show you with my own pictures, which look like they've been drawn by a four-year-old, but please bear with me. So here's the cathode, here's the anode on the skin. And here you can see, this is a plasma membrane, intracellular, extracellular, lots of sodiums on the outside, lots of potassiums on the inside and negative macromolecules. So you deliver, let's say positives from the anode and it gets real positive here. So what happens? These positives wanna go away and they come over here. So now this area of membrane has uh, depolarized and these positives wanna go here to the cathode, which is negative. And so it's a capacitive current and that's how stimulation occurs. Now you've seen it, you can forget it if you want, but at least someone's explained it to you. Um, so I think this is a good place to stop. So, uh, all right. Okay, so we talked about what a nerve is, we talked about what stimulation is, and we talked about how that externally delivered electrical impulse affects and why it affects. And we talked about what the plasma membrane is and how you get a resting membrane potential and what an action potential is. Really, that's a lot you've learned if you can you know, review it again later. Um, so now I said electrodes, electrodes, what are electrodes? Well, it's again, uh, we just finished talking about the black box of the patient. Now I'm going to go to the black box of the equipment. So I'm going to tell you what's really inside there. So electrodes are any metal that conducts electricity. They make all direct contact with the uh, patient and they serve as the interface. That's their function. They do form a battery with the body where the uh, gel or the extracellular fluid are the uh, electrolyte solution. And you have two types of electrodes, surface electrodes that attach to the skin and needle electrodes, which go through the skin. And you're gonna learn the names of the electrodes. There's the stimulators we already talked about, cathode and anode. And for pickup, you have different uh, naming conventions. Um, E1, E2, and ground are considered the kind of the technically correct one, electrode one, electrode two, and ground. Uh, G1, G2 refers to the old tube technology. So grid one, grid two, it's fine. It's the same thing. And then active reference and ground are the same thing as well. I'd say know them all just so you never get confused. And you can see different shapes here and different types and there's advantages to each one. So this is a good time to bring up resistance if we're gonna talk about surface electrodes. So we talked, we talked about how if you, know, you have a push or a voltage, then that's gonna increase current. But you can get in the way of um, uh, current and that's called resistance. So the quality of the pathway, the cross-sectional area, so resistance describes that. But in um, electrodiagnosis, we actually use the word impedance. Technically for you geeks, the reason we use impedance is because we're dealing with varying voltages, whereas resistance is for only one single voltage. So from now on, call it impedance and you'll be good. So the problem with surface electrodes is that you've got this giant resistor called skin getting in the way of these tiny little, you know, microvolt uh, currents that you're trying to pick up. So that's why when you're doing sensory studies, it's super important to start by swabbing 
the skin. You're removing oil, sweat, dirt, stratum corneum, you know, dead skin cells, makeup, everything, lotion, all of this stuff gets in the way of your amplitudes. So just don't skip this step and you'll be better off. You'll save time actually. Conducting gel also helps with that because it helps with the current being detected by the pickup electrodes. Uh, by the way, if you wear black pants and you wipe the gel on your pants, when you get home, you have to explain to your wife why you have all this white powder on your pants. So, you know, wipe on the paper towels instead. So current flows from the cathode. Now we're answering the question. Current flows from the cathode the way I showed you in that four-year-old diagram. Then it spreads throughout the body from there, right? That current that you've just delivered, that block of current, actually gets picked up by the electrodes immediately, and it gets displayed on the screen. And that is called stimulation artifact. That's it right there. That's the shock from the stimulator traveling throughout the body when you press the button. The computer treats that as T equals zero. Remember we said the x-axis is time, the y-axis is voltage. So you're lucky that you don't have an oscilloscope where you have to sit there and like measure. The computer takes care of that. It stores it, says this is t equals zero, and then whatever happens afterwards, that has a time associated with it. Cool, right? Stimulation artifact. So now we've covered the nerve being stimulated. We've talked about electrodes. Let's talk about what the word pickup really means. This is... The very intimidating con uh, topic of volume conduction theory, which I am going to simplify for you now in two slides, okay? Volume conduction theory just means what is the physics of how voltages and currents behave in a volume in three dimensions. And since our patients are in three dimensions and we're using currents, we should know some aspects of volume conduction theory. So here you see a very complicated looking picture. But really, this one you're already familiar with. When sodium conductance open, uh, sodium conductance changes, meaning that the channels open and then the potassium channels open. Oh, by the way, you may not have known this, but sodium and potassium channels open at the same time. It's just that potassium are slower to open and slower to close. And that's what you see in this picture here. And that results in this change in electrical potential across the membrane, right? And what this picture is telling you is that basically sodiums from out here are going through here and they're traveling in this direction. They're going through here, they're traveling in this direction. And this is basically like a sink. It's like a vortex, right? Because those ion channels are open. So if this is the sink, then this is the source and this is the source. And you have a source, sink, source that is traveling along the membrane and gives you this potential. And now we're going to put that into, into theory, which is you can understand that the pickup electrode attached to the skin basically works like a microphone. It's picking up the traveling wave of depolarization through the skin. And you start to see a waveform. As it propagates away, the displayed waveform changes. And at all times in the machine, charge is measured at E1 is compared to the ground electrode placed elsewhere on the body. This is the key to understanding volume conduction theory. You've got this source, which is positive, and then it becomes a sink, which is negative. So there's a zero point somewhere along the line. Then there's another source, and that's positive. And then you hit isoelectric again. And that's why it starts to get more and more positive, And then eventually it gets to zero. And then it gets more negative, And then it gets back to zero. And then it gets positive, And you get this triphasic waveform. I mean, this is mind blowing if you haven't thought about it. This is what we're seeing on the screen. This is volume conduction theory made simple. Sarah, anything to add or? No, oh, I, I think that's fabulous. Yeah, basically, like positive sharp waves, fibrillations, all of that, you'll finally understand them now if you understand this concept that you're basically seeing like a microphone of like a, um, a, a, a wave of depolarization. Okay, so now we know nerves, the stimulation, the pickup electrodes. We said that 
the SNAP is the electrical signal summation of discharges by the sensory neurons depolarizing membranes. This is one of the biggest misconceptions I see that, that, that we start out with. And then when we learn it, it makes everything make sense. So I'm going to just tell you right now what, we're, what that misconception is. Remember I told you about how an axon has an action potential? Well, a nerve is going to be a collection of all those action potentials. It's a histogram. So basically, this is a study where some geek went into the microscope, looked at all of the axons inside a sural nerve, cat sural nerve, right? And put the diameters, uh, like the, the number of axons that were different diameters, okay? So what we know is that the bigger the diameter, the faster it conducts and the more uh, current it'll generate too, right? So you can use a computer to model how a waveform would look. And when you add them all up, it looks like a snap. So if you don't understand this, you get all confused when people are talking about demyelination and you know, like slowing and conduction block. So this is just to see if you're awake. So, so which direction is the action potential propagating away from the stimulator? So I told you that the cathode uh, is delivering current and there's an mm -hmm. action potential generated. So is it, is it moving distally toward the hand? Is it moving proximally toward the midline of the body? Neither direction, both directions. Um, A, distally towards the hand. And- uh, Sorry, Jake, I think you're muted. So wouldn't it be oh. moving in both directions? Yeah, that's just in both as well. Correct. The reason is, so any answer you gave other than neither direction would have been okay because you'd be right. But what it is is that in um, a normal um, physiologic situation, let's say it's sensory, you initiate the action potential here and it only has one direction to go in. And for motor, you're starting in the anterior horn cell. So it only has one direction to go in, right? But here it's exogenously, exogenously created and there's no refractory period on either side. So it's gonna go in both directions. It's just something to keep in mind. You know, even though all we're caring about right now is what's happening distally, it's happening in both directions. Cool. So check, check this out. I just love that. I saw that in the movie and I had to keep it. So temperature does affect the sodium and potassium channels the same way that it affects enzymes. So they're going to be slower to open and slower to close. And this results in a very practical point. You get slower conduction velocity and you get more charges entering the axon. So this is, if this is normal, then this is what your snap is going to look like when your hands are cold. It's gonna be delayed, it's gonna be larger, it's gonna have a longer duration, and it's gonna be, um, you know, and, and that onset change in the latency is going to reflect in a slower conduction velocity. So when you see a crappy uh, electrodiagnostic test by someone uh, on the outside who spent five minutes with the patient and there was only um, large uh, amplitude snaps that were delayed with slow conduction velocities and they called it a diffuse sensory demyelinating neuropathy, throw that study out. They just had cold limbs. This is very practical. See, I, I, I always feel like I have to justify. Uh... So we're back to the black box, right? You've seen this amplifier that you plug your electrodes into. Well, what's going on in there? So after the electrodes pick up the signal, they get plugged into what's called a differential amplifier. And I'm gonna explain what that does now. So bottom line thus far is that the electrode is trying to pick up the tiny signals as cleanly as possible. And, you know, interface with the patient. The purpose of the differential amplifier is then to reveal the differences between what's being picked up by the two electrodes and then to amplify this difference. So let's uh, break down the word differential amplifier. Amplifier just means making something bigger. Nerves generate really tiny voltages and you need to be able to use them. The equipment needs to make them bigger for their use. So since they need to be amplified, um, we apply what a factor of amplification called gain. So gain is output divided by input. So it has no units because it's a ratio. So my classmate, Dr. Rigg was um, 
the uh, former uh, guitar player of the Blue Oyster Cult. So I made this slide back then. If Dr. Riggs' guitar signal, his input is 10, and the amp puts out a signal of 110, what is the gain? And for the geeks there, um, the answer, of course, 110 divided by 10 is 11. The answer is 11. And if you've watched Spinal Tap, you know why that's funny. OK, so that's how you decide gain, output divided by input. Differential means comparing or subtracting. So you know there's all this noise everywhere on your body, and that can obscure the signal. So the second electrode on the body serves as a quote unquote reference of this baseline noise. So we improve the signal by subtracting this out. So let's do, a, uh, let's do this as a thought experiment. So if I have a po it's that's supposed to be a positive sharp wave. You can't see it, it's gotten um, whited out. But you have two identical amplifiers except one that inverts the recorded signal compared to the other. So if E1 and E2 are seeing the same positive sharp wave, you're gonna see this amplified signal and you're gonna see an inverted version of that amplified signal. And when you add them up, what do you get? Nothing, they cancel out, right? And that's the purpose. If they're both seeing it, then, the, then we believe that that's noise. If they're both seeing the same thing at the same time, I wanna cancel that out. And that's the purpose of having a reference electrode. It's to subtract out the noise. As a thought experiment, what if one amplifier did not invert the signal? Then you'd get basically a giant version of it, right? So that means if you understand that, then you understand differential amplifiers. The last thing is nothing in reality is perfect, right? So generally you would think these would cancel out, but since the two electrodes and the two amplifiers don't have exactly identical impedances and perfectly exactly the same in gain, et cetera. A little bit does sneak through, but the engineers have made it so that they can measure how much sneaks through. It's called common mode rejection ratio. How good it is at getting rid of that is called common mode rejection ratio. And all of the commercially available instruments, instruments should have a 10,000 to one uh, common word rejection ratio. This is super geeky. The only reason I'm telling you this is because it's a board question every year and the answer is 10,000 to one. And I have uh, derivations and shortcuts at the end of this lecture if you want to learn it better. Um, but the point I was trying to make is that you have two amplifiers. The active minus the reference is what you're getting uh, as your signal. So have you guys heard about the optimal separation of four centimeters? Yeah, no, Nick says no. Well, Nick, um, when you go on your electrodiagnostic rotation, you might hear, oh, you need to separate those electrodes by four centimeters for your snaps. The reason they're saying this is because, listen, it's a, I'm gonna just put everything on the screen, okay? And then we, well, I can do this. So if you wanted to get rid of as much noise as possible, Nick, if you can unmute. If you wanted to put get rid of as much noise as possible, what would I have to do to the active and, elect and reference in terms of distance? Hmm. If the active minus the reference gets rid of noise. Yeah, I'm not sure if you'd want it closer or farther away. I'm trying to think of. Right. So the closer they are, the more they're going to see the same stuff, right? and then they'd subtract out. Remember we said that in the, in the first slide? So they're both seeing the same thing. So then algebraically, if you add this to this, you get nothing. So that's the whole purpose of the differential amplifier. So if you put them really close together, everything will cancel out. You can understand that, right? Yeah. But if I put them too close together, then I've canceled everything out and then I won't see my snap or my, the waveforms I care about, right? So there's a certain amount of distance that we can get as close as possible without canceling it out, right? So in the upper limbs, that is four centimeters. So there's a um, experiment here where the guy put the electrodes further and further apart. And the further he went, the more amplitude he got until he got to four centimeters. And then after that, it didn't matter anymore. So experimentally, we see that. But we can also algebraically um, show that. If you understand that we want, the, um, we want the rise time, the peak to have finished before we start uh, 
canceling out. We want that to happen. After that, I don't care what you cancel out. So basically, if you know that velocity equals distance over time and the velocity of a uh, nerve in the upper limb is 50, then what we're trying to do is calculate that distance. But what's the time? Well, we know that the rise time is 0.8 milliseconds. So that's long enough for the peak to have happened. So if we can say uh, traveling at 50 meters per second over 0.8 milliseconds, that gives you a distance of four centimeters. So four centimeters is enough in the upper limbs for sensory, for separation. So memorize four centimeters, but only memorize it for upper limb. For lower limb, as you know, the velocity is lower. It's 40 meters per second. And if you calculate that, that ends up being 3.2 centimeters. And if you look at your bar electrode, that's how far apart it is. So you're good with that and you don't have to memorize four centimeters. Point is, don't put them too close together. But if you put them too far apart, you won't get enough noise cancellation. Is everyone good with that final point? Yeah, OK. OK, so filters. Filters are basically stuff that take out noise. There's a lot you can learn about them. I'm going to make it very straightforward for you. Filters remove stuff. There's low cut filters, which remove low frequencies. There's high cut filters that remove high frequencies. Everything that's in between is called your bandwidth. And if you remove too many frequencies, then it affects the waveform. And the way we know this is by frequency spectrum analysis or Fourier analysis. So let me explain that in very easy to understand terms. Can you see how algebraically, if I add up all these waveforms, these sine waves, I will get this as a resultant? Yeah. So biologic signals can be applied to this way too. So maybe it's a little bit of a stretch for you, but you can see how if you add this up, you might get this. OK, so what the filters do is they're either removing high frequency stuff or low frequency stuff. As you can see, low frequency stuff affects things like duration, whereas high frequency stuff is affecting the onset. And maybe if you have more high frequency than low frequency, you're getting more phases. Maybe your peak is a little earlier. If you have more low frequency stuff, you have a bigger amplitude. Can you kind of just qualitatively, conceptually see that? If you understand that, then this next slide doesn't become so difficult. Basically, if you, decrease, if you increase the low frequency filter, meaning you're taking out more low frequencies, that's going to take out amplitude. That's going to bring your uh, peak latency earlier because now there's more high frequencies contributing. It'll shorten your negative spike duration and you'll have more phases because it looks more like the high frequencies. So I'm not going to go over this in detail, but this is on the boards every year. So seniors definitely go through this. And then for... Um, the high frequency filter, eh, those high frequencies don't really affect uh, amplitude so much, but they do affect um, your onset latency. So if you remove high frequencies, your onset latency will be further away. So practically, how does this affect you? Well, if the Cadwell rep is trying to sell you a machine and saying, oh, look how good our baseline is, go into their uh, uh, filter settings and just see if they're, they're trying to game you a little. That's it. And also it's a board question. Otherwise, it's kind of it's kind of, you don't really need to know too much about it, practically speaking. Sound make is important. One comment. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll just make one comment that um, that one point about filters is that sometimes uh, when uh, we're learning about them, we might get, the, the questions always ask about lowering and raising the filters, but lowering and, ra and lowering and raising the high frequency versus lowering and raising the low frequency. But oftentimes, sometimes when you're in training, you might get confused at lowering and raising the filter is, it's, it's actually not synonymous with lowering and raising the filtration. So it doesn't mean that if you're lowering the filter, a certain filter that you're not filtering as much. And it doesn't mean that if you're raising a filter, you're filtering more. It's just, it's, there's a technical difference between the two. Where the cutoff frequency is, you're either raising the cutoff frequency or you're lowering the cutoff frequency. And then that leaves you with less bandwidth or more bandwidth, exactly. So keep that clear in your head. So sound is great because when we hear the sound, after a while, you can start to recognize potentials without even looking at them. If it's sharp and high pitched, it's close, close to you. If it's low pitched, it's relatively distant. So computers, I used to go into this in depth, and I'm going to just say this. What the computer does is it takes an analog signal, and then uh, depending on how 
strong of a calculation it does, it can make it less and less pixelated. So, you know, there was a big problem in the audio in industry when um, CDs came out because we weren't getting the whole song. We weren't getting all the audio. And most people didn't care about that. But I bet you care about your pictures, what the resolution of your pictures are, right? So the more pixelated it is, the more, the less um, digital uh, calculation has been done on it. And you can see how that might affect back in the day when computers were first being used. So that's all I'm going to say about that. The good thing about it is you can use a computer to store a waveform and then do calculations. And one awesome uh, thing that a computer can do is averaging. So basically, um, let's say you have this waveform and you're like, whoa, this is just garbage, right? But let's say you take this waveform and then you take another waveform, you add them algebraically at every point, and then you divide by two you'll get the average of that waveform after a certain amount of time. And the things that are noise will go away because they're, you know, canceling each other out. And the things that are always there will just kind of add up. So averaging is a very strong technique that can be used uh, when looking at sensory nerves uh, to get rid of noise, especially if, if you have low amplitude um, snaps that are muddied through the noise. So displays, Again, I used to nerd out on this. You remember these old computer monitors? These are basically cathode ray tubes. And what they are is, you know, uh, electrons are being sent to a fluorescent screen and it's just, you know, moving across the screen really fast. And that's how oscilloscopes worked. And you've seen oscilloscopes or, you know, the version, the digital version of oscilloscopes now uh, when you see EKGs and, and stuff. Um, and so that's where I think you get the word sweep because the oscilloscope had to sweep back and forth. And so that's why it's just um, talking about the x-axis. So the, when we use the word sensitivity or display sensitivity, we're talking about how big something is on the screen uh, measured in microvolts per centimeter or microvolts per division or millivolts per division. And it really isn't that important for sensory, but it is important for motor. And we'll get to that later. Uh, and it's a different uh, topic than gain. And unfortunately, most of our knobs say gain, even though we're changing the sensitivity. The thing is, I asked the Cadwell rep and he said, he put me with the engineer and the engineer said, well, you're, you're also changing the gain stage in the differential amplifier in anticipation of needing a bigger gain. Again, this is all for geeks, but just keep the word gain and, and uh, sensitivity as maybe kind of synonymous. So this is, I would like you know, to just share that this has taken years to develop this slide. Um, in order to explain what happens in the machine, I had my former resident draw this and I put this animation together for you. So the stimulator, watch the screen, ready? The stimulator delivers current to the nerve and the action potential propagates to the hand. The three electrodes pick up the activity and feed it into a differential amplifier, which amplifies the differences between the different electrodes. The resultant signal is then filtered and convert it into computer ones and zeros so it can be stored, manipulated, and measured. This can then be heard through a speaker and the evoked response can then be viewed on a display. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was like a whole morning figuring out all those animations. So now you know what the black box is doing in theory. So you know what the nerve is doing, you know the evoked response. I think we're on evoked response now actually. So what is an evoked response? It's the waveform observed on the screen. X-axis is time, Y-axis is voltage. And we measure latencies and durations. For sensory nerve conduction studies, the pickup electrodes are picking up the summation of the axolemal discharges, right? We do them, they look like this. You can see those ring electrodes in the hand. You can see the bar electrode in the um, foot. And I just reminded you that these are histograms by showing you this picture again. And the snap looks like this. It's got an onset latency, a peak latency, a duration. And this is what they look like from my machine. So what are sensory nerve conduction studies? You asked for Wilborn, Sarah, I'm giving you Wilborn. So cutaneous nerves or sensory nerve, sensory components of mixed nerves are measured in sensory nerve con conduction studies. They're stimulated at some point along their course and impulses are recorded more distally or proximally. The waveform obtained with supramaximal stimulus is a sensory nerve action potential. If you pick up proximally 
sorry, you stimulate proximally and you pick up distally. So you stim here, let's say the median nerve and you pick up over the middle finger. That's going in the opposite direction that is physiologic. So that would be called an antidromic study. And if you did the opposite where you stimulated fr from the distal, from the finger and you picked up proximally, that's going in the same direction that sensory nerves usually conduct. That's called orthodromic. Orthodromics um, have less motor artifact, have no motor artifact, but antidromics have larger amplitudes. So take your pick. Dr. Um, Malhotra, do you mind yeah. if I interrupt you um, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit? Um, just because uh, since some of our residents may um, not have been really exposed to an EMG yet, if you could uh, kind of go over antidromic orthodromic, if you could go back to that slide for just a moment. Yeah. So just wanted to kind of go over the, that a study. So it's a, um, a study can be done in either way. You could decide where you want the pickup to be. It's just that it makes sense to do it certain ways. So like sensory, like your carpal tunnel study, median sensory study, it makes, it's, you could do, it's, it, there's a standard convention that most studies for that are done antidromically, it means that you stimulate proximally and then you pick up distally, but that same study could actually be reversed. You could in fact um, stimulate distally and pick up proximally. You could actually take your ring electrodes and turn them into a stimulator. You could actually stimulate and then pick up like with a bar electrode or pick up with another electrode proximally. It's just that by convention there, and what Dr. Malhotra is explaining is that there are pluses and minuses to doing either uh, of that. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah, each of these slides, hopefully you can go back to and just think about or discuss with your attendings. So I wanna go over stimulation terminology. Stimulation terminology, see the square wave there? So intensity is just how many amps uh, you provide. Duration or pulse width is measured in microseconds. That's how long this is. So you may increase the pulse width to try and get the, the um, current deeper. And then ter the terms uh, describing stimulation really are based, they're functional terms. They're based on what you see on the evoked response. So subthreshold means I'm giving them current and I don't see anything but a stimulus artifact. So here's a stimulus artifact and there's no evoked response. Threshold is when I just start seeing a little nub of uh, depolarization. And then anything above that is submaximal until you get to a point where it's just not getting any bigger. So I keep increasing the stimulus. Um, and then when it stops changing, I'll call that maximal stimulation. And then we'll add 20 to 30% more stimulus to that maximal current to ensure that we've got the whole nerve so that no one can say, oh, well, this is a submaximal stimulation. No, I know that it was super maximal. And you can see there the maximal and the super maximal don't look any different. So I have given you this. Um, so uh, I, I had a question actually. Sure. So we, um, we talked about like the, you know, the, the summation of action potential. So before you said, you just said that you, when you do super max, it's that you stimulated the whole nerve. Did you mean that you stimulated all the nerves or is it? Are you, nerve, or? nerve means bundle of fascicles and fascicles are bundles of axons. So okay. when I say median nerve, I mean all the axons in, in the median nerve. Gotcha. So um, this is how I do it. I, you know, I prepare the skin, I secure them, I measure. The thing is that once I get to threshold, I don't start increasing my stim. I move my stimulator a little bit medial or a, med a little bit lateral to confirm that I'm right over the nerve. And then I start cranking up. So you can look at this later for how I teach my residents to do it. So what we measure... I, start, I used to start with latency, but at the latest AANEM, they said we should change our conventions and start reporting amplitude first because it is the most important parameter as it tends to correlate with clinical symptoms such as weakness and sensory de deficits because it's affecting the large fiber modalities. And the large fibers are what we're testing when we do our nerve conduction studies. So the amplitude is the height of the evoked response and it can either be from base to peak or it can be from peak to peak. Now remember, up is negative and down is positive. Just memorize that. I can tell you why later. But if you do base to peak amplitude, or you can do peak 
to peak amplitude. You just have to make sure that your um, normal value, normative data reflects um, you know, good studies that have looked at that. So it is a semi-quantitative measure of the number of axons conducting impulses from the stimulating to the recording point when surface electrodes are used. So why not peak to peak? Here's some reasons why I use base, base to peak. Okay. So my colleague, Helen, she used to say, why don't we just crank it up on the first stem? So there's a lot of good reasons, um, but you know, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna go over the shortened onset latency later, um, but you can stimulate nearby nerves. And I'm gonna show a better picture of that later. So if I crank this up too much, then the median and the ulnar will be stimulated at the same time and that could you know, throw off things. Um, let's talk about latency. Latency is basically any time expressed in milliseconds. Sensory latencies reflect exclusively nerve impulse conduction time between stimulation and recording sites. Onset latency is basically the time from the stim artifact to the first uh, deflection. And it doesn't tell you anything about how many fibers are doing this, just that the fastest fibers are actually conducting that fast. Peak latency is the negative inflection uh, point, which is easier to uh, measure, but it's not really telling you about the fastest fibers. And latency can be affected by bad stimulation technique. Let me give you some examples. You could do too much current, which can erroneously shorten latency. I'm going to show you that. And artifact is the biggest one. So why not just crank it up? So this is actually a CMAP. But the idea is, I, I put a pebble in a pond here. Imagine putting a pebble in a pond. You get a ripple. If you threw a giant rock in there, you'd have a huger one, right? So if this is my nerve here and I'm stimulating here, but I give a giant stimulation, then it's effectively stimulating here. And now I've shortened the distance from my pickup electrode to where I'm stimulating. So that can artificially reduce your onset latency. The second thing um, is stimulus artifact. This is literally one of my studies where I could not get rid of this stimulus artifact and it's obscuring my onset. Um, so it could be affecting my base to peak amplitude and it could be affecting my onset latency. So when the current from the stimulator's electrodes instantaneously extending throughout the body um, create this, then it can really throw off your study. And so I've put together a list of things you can do, basically a lot of cleaning, make sure you've got gel, and then there's another thing that you'll see your attendings do. It's called anodal rotation. So in the palm, it's especially helpful. You keep the cathode where it is once you've found the peak, and then you just start moving like you're using a compass. And what this does is it changes those isopotential electrical you know, lines that you saw when you were in physics. And you know, it gives you less stimulus artifact. Is that also called inching? Is that different? No, that is not inching. So inching would be if I changed my cathode location you know, along the course of the nerve. This, my cathode is in exactly the same spot. I leave it there, but I keep rotating so that my anode is moving in different directions. Thank you for asking that. So what we measure is, uh, another thing is conduction velocity. But I got to tell you, conduction velocity is super fraught with error because it depends on us measuring, right? It also depends on where those latencies are put and stuff. So velocity is distance over time. The numerator is the what you found on your tape measure and the denominator is the difference in onsets. And it reflects an average conduction velocity over that segment. So if you wanted specifically, then you would do inching. Perfect that someone brought that up. Um, distally, your nerves tend to be slower for a number of reasons. One is your fingers are cooler than your arm is, right? And we talked about cooling with that slide with the uh, sloth. And um, also they taper distally. So maybe they're a little uh, thinner. So maybe it's conducting a little less. Um, and the diameters are smaller. Um, if you see an abnormally low calculated nerve conduction velocity, it could be loss of fastest conducting fibers, or it could be actual demyelination. And I've put some geeky stuff in there. Another Dr. thing that could have- Just yeah. a quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, Tell me if this is true or not, but I had heard or learned, I don't remember now, that nerves are also less myelinated the more distal they go. Is that true or not true? Any evidence to back Well, up? I think, uh, yeah, I think because they're tapered. So um, I'm pretty sure there's also thinning of, not thinning, but like less 
you know, myelin the myelin. I'll try and look that up for you, though. That's a good question. So um, this is typical, and I still do this. Sometimes the machine just switches the cathode and anode between studies and you forget. And so really, X is based on you know, where the cathode was, but you happen to not switch the cathode and anode. So now you've added this extra three centimeters, right? And so you haven't put that in your calculation. And so your velocity will seem to be slower because you didn't switch them around. Simply, each time you do a study, look at where the cathode is and make sure it's in the right place. So another thing we can look at is phases. Snaps tend to be biphasic or triphasic. Um, and I'm not going to get into that, but I've had plenty of discussions about why they are triphasic or, or biphasic. Another thing you can look at is duration. And it depends you know, who you're talking to, whether it's just a negative peak duration or it's the entire duration. And it mainly reflects the relative conduction rates of the impulses as they travel along various axons between the two points. Where it's really um, important is how it contributes uh, to area, because duration times area, duration times amplitude will give you area. And th that reflects better than amplitude, the number of axons being activated. Problem is with snaps, you have an issue when you stimulate proximally. It's called temporal dispersion and phase cancellation. How many people, thumbs up, and you don't have to answer if it's a thumbs down, how many people feel confident with temporal dispersion and phase cancellation. I haven't seen a single thumbs up. So cool. I'm going to be the guy to, to explain this to you. So do you remember how I told you it's a, um, it's a histogram, right? So you have fast fibers and you have slow fibers, right? So there's a difference between the fastest and the slowest. And so if they were all conducting at exactly the same speed, you'd have this really thin, really high amplitude um, waveform. But since that's not the case, it's spread out a little. That's called temporal dispersion. And for that reason, your amplitude will be lower. OK, so what? There's a little bit of temporal dispersion. Well, I stole this slide from the AANEM. I, I literally took it, a picture of it. And I have to give credit to Dr. Bromberg. So that you've always heard this runner's analogy. Well. What are they talking about? So here you have, normally, you have people who can run a seven minute mile and those who can run a six minute mile. And there's a bunch of people that are somewhere in between, right? So if they are running one mile, this is probably the difference in distance between these guys, right? The fastest guy gets there um, about a mile before the other guy, uh, a minute before the other guy, right? But if they run 10 miles, you're going to see a huge difference between the fastest one getting there and the slowest one getting there, right? So the usually what I say is, hey, I'm relatively deconditioned. My resident works out. We can get from this room to that room probably at the same time. You won't see much of a difference. But if we're going to the parking lot, he'll probably get there much quicker than me, right? Does that make sense? So over a short, shorter distance, there'll be less temporal dispersion then there will be over a longer distance. Okay, before I move on, I want thumbs ups. Do you guys understand that? So your snap amplitude will be lower just by the fact that you're stimulating further away. Right? Patrick? Yeah? Okay. Vikran, you're good? Okay. That's temporal dispersion. Um, wait, where's the... Ah, where's my... Phase cancellation. Oh, well, I had a phase cancellation one too, but I can use this. So I told you that snaps have uh, upgoing and downgoing components. There's um, negative and positive peaks. Well, because they're temporally dispersed, the positives and negatives, the upgoing and downgoing can overlap. And that causes cancellation. So not only do you have temporal dispersion, you have phase cancellation. So the more proximal you go, or the further you go from where you're picking up, the lower the amplitude will get. And that's why with snaps, you really have to be careful looking at amplitudes as you go further. You, you know what I mean? So side to side comparisons are good there. Do you guys understand temporal dispersion and phase cancellation now? I hope so. 
It's not oh. as scary as it looks, right? Uh, a question for so temporal dispersion completely get now the phase cancellation is there like an analogy with the runner that you could explain is that that someone's running in the opposite direction uh, i wouldn't try i wouldn't okay. try i think just go algebraic like you can see that um there's an up going and a down going and they're overlapping and that's going to negate each other right yeah fair so enough. that leads to that leads to this what you see down here phase cancellation as well so this is a normal finding in snaps. The confusion occurs when you see abnormal temporal dispersion. And what uh, this is trying to show is that you could have a certain amount of demyelination, you know, and they're, the runners are running through molasses or a swamp. And so there's more of a difference between the, the fastest and the slowest. So, but I, I hope that that clarified it for you. Um, uh, this sorry, is... I just wanted to interrupt you for a second. Um, yep. Sorry for the inter all the interruptions, but no, um, I love the it. other the other thing was um, that I wanted to mention was that these the terms are often said together because one commit can influence the other also. So the more that things are dispersed, it will allow things to be out of phase and cancel each other out. So then it's almost like you can't you can't have you cannot have phase can phase cancellation without things actually being dispersed. So true. But yeah, that's why just same together. Although, although, yeah, yeah, that's good. Good advice. This is from the Wilborn again, um, where he gets into more details about the pluses and minuses of sensories, uh, sensory nerve conduction studies. And then there's plenty of things that can go wrong, again, from the Wilborn with um, snaps. And I'd encourage you to go through these. Let's get back to that case. We're almost at the two hour point. So we chose to do median and ulnar snaps, motor studies, late responses, repetitive stim, EMG, depending on what we saw on those sensory studies, right? So not that this is what would happen in a normal lab. We'd probably do a little bit more. But if she's like, I hate this, I don't want any more. Having just this was good enough to say, OK, the onset latency was prolonged at 14 centimeters. Um, I can't use the palm amplitude, so I can't say. The amplitude was fine for my normals. But when I look at the wrist to palm segment, look at your wrist to palm segment, it's here. It was 23 meters per second. And the palm to second digit segment here was 63 meters per second. And then of course, average that out and you get 34. Whoa, there's something going on in that wrist segment. And the left ulnar was totally normal. Normal amplitude, uh, well, maybe it's a little borderline for a young female. I think this might've been an old guy, but uh, uh, you know, and the velocity reflects a normal onset latency. So we're gonna say she has carpal tunnel. There is, this is an, ab my electrodiagnostic impression would be there is electrodiagnostic evidence at this time of a demyelinating sensory median mononeuropathy at the wrist, consistent with the clinical diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. So I want, the residents to give me some thoughts. What about the radic? Can I say anything about radic? No. Why? I didn't do needles, right? Uh, peripheral polyneuropathy seems less likely given that the ulnar was normal, but I would probably want to do some more nerves just to show because that 10 was borderline. Um, a plexopathy. Uh, well, she could have a concomitant plexopathy, but we definitely showed a conduction slowing across the tunnel. So there is that but I could be to Sean's point. I think it was Sean that said, hey, should I be doing other things? Yeah, there could be other things, but hopefully my screening history and physical ruled that out. And so we have just gone through, it, it took a lot longer than I thought, but we've gone through electrophysiology, um, neurophysiology, instrumentation. Um, we've actually talked about snaps. We've talked about the sensory differential. Um, we went through some fairly deep concepts of phase cancellations, you know, temporal dispersion, things like that. And, you know, how stimulation, you know, of motor uh, uh, stimulation increases, you know, submaximal, maximal, all of that. I mean, we've covered a lot. I know it must feel like a jumble, but Sarah, what do you think? I mean, I think, I think if they go back to this, they can get something out of it. Oh, you're muted. 
sorry. Usually what happens is the first time you go is always an introduction. You have to look at this information many, many, many times, be quizzed on it, do questions, and then, you know, ask your colleagues, uh, senior residents, if there's something you don't understand, ask your attendings. Asking your senior residents is actually good because it makes forces them to go and consult the books. That's actually the method in which everybody learns. Yeah. And remember, the Except if they don't give you the correct information. Right, right. Yeah. Check everything they've said. So, you know, it's the Star Wars thing again. Like, you know, you just watched the three movies, but now you're like, oh my God, now I get what happened, you know, why that was important in Star Wars. Let me go back to Star Wars and see, oh, now that context makes more sense. So I've told my residents when it comes to physical exams, ask me to show you or ask your attendings to show you the same physical exam maneuver each year, because each time you're going to hear the same thing. But you're going to be like, oh, wait, that's what you meant by that. Oh, you know, and it's the same thing with this stuff. So the cool thing is it's like a cocktail party. You meet a bunch of people. You don't remember their names and stuff. But just the fact that you met them, the next time you see them, you're like, oh, we met. Remember that? And that familiarity, that's how this information should feel now. So let's take a break. And Sarah, I need your advice on what to do next. Yeah, there's all these slides and I'll, I'll send the slides to you guys. But um, it's all the stuff that I used to teach um in depth that i summarized um that maybe some people will like uh but the nice thing is you didn't have to sit through it so i have one quick question actually would there be any utility in like making um the locations for the pickup electrodes uniform when we're testing for things um to limit limit the temporal dispersion uh no, uh, there'll be, um, you can standardize your um, stim points, like meaning how far away from the active you are. That's the only thing you can do. So with um, median mononeuropathy, we actually at this point are pretty comfortable saying there shouldn't be a 50%, more than a 50% drop from palm to stim. But all the other places that you stim, I don't believe there are well-established, agreed-upon normative data to say, like, if, you know, if you get this much of a drop, that's, that's significant. You really, you're, you're depending on side to side. For example, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. There's plenty of patients where if they've got beefy enough stims, uh, you know, distally, I will do below elbow and above elbow, mm -hmm. and then compare that to the other side to say, oh, you know, blocked here, but I got you know, something here, maybe that's significant. It correlates with the motor, but I don't know of any way to move the elect, like the active and reference closer together to make that better. All that'll do is remove more noise. That doesn't matter, like putting it on like the, the red and black and the palm of the wrist and like a certain MCP, like every single time it won't change things. I guess You're talking about motor, first of all. All I did was sensory here, oh, but, for but for motor, uh, there, there are caveats in terms of like, so motor for temporal dispersion and phase cancellation, completely different um, topic, which I will cover possibly in the next lecture if Sarah okay. thinks I should do that. Okay. Any questions on that? I love questions. So if you have any questions, go for it. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm one of the one of the fourth years. I have not started my EMG um, like kind of endeavors yet. But what's interesting is the, the few that I've done, like when we get the referrals, you know, some are just like an ortho hand person refers you and it's carpal tunnel. It's all we want you to look at where some the referral is, you know, do a whole neuromuscular exam. And unfortunately, you find out that, yeah, this person had carpal tunnel, they get their surgery, and then two months later, you realize that they have like cervical, you know, cervical disease. So I guess, how do you broach that? Like, if you just get a referral, and it's like, just rule out carpal tunnel, like, do you just rule out carpal tunnel? Super cool question. Thank you for asking that. It's one of those, we're, uh, we're being recorded, and I, uh, and I have nothing to hide. Look, I work in two settings, private and uh, the VA. VA is academic. I can take all the time in the world I want. In the private, I do have a certain amount of time set. And the people who are referring to me tend to be very good neurosurgeons and anesthesia pain docs who I, resp who I respect. Okay, so I have a, I'm, I'm a little spoiled because they actually think about other things. Um, so let's pretend I didn't have that. 
absolutely you should be thinking about everything the whole time. I've had carpal tunnel referrals that I found ALS in. Now pretend it was the other way around. And I said, look, I was just asked about the carpal tunnel. So, uh, you know, I did the carpal tunnel exam. And then three years later, this guy was found to have ALS and he had an EMG with Dr. Malhotra who missed his ALS. Man, that would suck. Wow, what a bad doctor I'd be, right? So one thing that helps you, I'm not gonna answer it exactly, but I'm gonna give you a piece of advice that helped me answer this. Um, a cardiologist gave me two of these and I added the third. When in doubt, what would you do if this patient were your mother? What would you do if this patient were your lawyer? And what would you do if this patient were your um, mentor in that topic that you were going to do, you know, morning, morning report for? So mother makes you think compassionately. Lawyer makes you think medical legally. And um, uh, mentor makes you think academically. And I'm always doing this. And it always, it's like when I'm at those points, like I could do this. Yeah, I probably should. And then, and then I do the right thing and I can sleep that night. So let's say you get a uh, referral for carpal tunnel. I think carpal tunnel, like Dr. Salim said, was easier than ulnar. Ulnar is more interesting. So whenever we get a referral for ulnar neuropathy, I find that my resident is far more prone to anchoring bias than I am. You guys know what anchoring bias is? Yeah, oh no. Anchoring bias is when someone says rule out ulnar neuropathy. So you're kind of like, oh yeah, it must be an ulnar nerve. Let me see if it is or isn't. Instead of just thinking about your differential from scratch again, right? So like you'll miss atyp atypical things or you'll miss things that are kind of hiding under the surface if you're anchored to, yeah, that must be what it is. You know, and bias is bias. Like it's all over the media now. You. You see a person who looks a certain way and you just assume things about them. That's the same with these uh, diagnoses. You think, oh, they sent it for carpal tunnel. No way that this guy has ALS, right? So you have to kind of wipe your mind slate clean of rule out carpal tunnel for a moment as you take your screening history and physical, which doesn't have to take more than 10 minutes. Dr. Salim's kind of shocked because I made them take a half hour on their histories and physicals, but I got you there, right? I got you to 10 and 15 minutes by your senior year. It's because you can always make comprehensive briefer. It's hard to go from not doing a lot to, to being more comprehensive. So that's, that's the thing. I'm sorry, Sean, did I answer your question or no? Not really. Should you do more? Yes, you should do more if your history and physical, um, dictate that. And I'll tell you why. The surgeon will appreciate it. The surgeon will be like, oh, thanks. You caught something that I almost did surgery on this guy and it was for the wrong place. You should try and keep all your patients out of surgery. All of them, even if they're referred to surgery, unless it's like indicated because most things aren't indicated. You know the indication. All right. So if you're carpal tunnel, they've tried splinting. They've tried, maybe they've even done an injection. Yeah. You should definitely have the surgery. I've demonstrated it, go get that surgery and get some, you know, good post-op therapy as well. Um, but not everything that's numb and tingly needs surgery. Not everything that hurts needs surgery. And you can be their advocate. Geez, I got on my high horse again. We'll never get to electrodiagnosis. Sorry. Sean, yes, no? Thank you. Does everyone understand? And thumbs down or, yeah. So Let's see. Yeah. My, my understanding is that this is why a square wave is used. And not that I understand much about square waves, but other than it's it's the best sum the the axons and the nerve together to create the most super optimal response. Yeah. So like like if you picture that this is the nerve and the skin is here, right? Like the even though you're delivering a square wave, it's not, it's not like this, right? It's actually like this. And then you increase and then you're getting like this. So you're getting half the nerve now, then you get most of the nerve and then you get a lot of it. And I don't think the choice of square wave or triangle wave or sawtooth wave or anything has anything to do with that. I think it's more, um, you are correct. We wanna get all those axons. And that's why we choose supermax stimulation, which I'll go over later. But I 
I have not read that. So if there's a source you have that says square waves are chosen for that reason, I think it's just technically easier to deliver a square wave. So, so I read something that it, it helps kind of with uh, the nerves firing more simultaneous, simultaneously. I mean, it would make sense. Yeah. But it, it kind of went a little more physics -y than I was. Uh, Could you send that to me? I would love to see yeah, that. I can try and find it. Thanks. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Did you choose that picture, Dr. Malhotra, because of the joke about the camel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it's, What's it's you on call so a camel? many levels. Camel with three hums. Pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to. I'm being recorded. Incidentally, so. yeah, the, the Bactrian uh, study also is based on, it's the Bactrian versus the dromedary. I remember the first time I was quizzed actually by my senior resident about what's the name of this comparison study? And then she was trying to give me hints and she said, okay, I'll like give a you camel. a hint. It's the name of a camel. And I go, huh? dromedary? And they're like, no, forget it. Read your book. Yeah. It's Bactrian. Drom Dromedarian is the one with one hump. Bactrian is the one with two humps. Exactly. You've yeah. just taken this slide as deep as it can go, Sarah. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's good.